Jean Dabre, and, and thanks for, for the words. It's, it's been a pleasure to be with you for all these years. This, this presentation today is about a topic on which we have done some research at the university. This is perfectionism. So, one of why I work with perfectionism? Well, there were a number of reasons for starting this research project. But um, let me say just a sentence. That perfectionism is all over the place. It relates to a big number of disorders and psychological problems. And there are different meanings we can give to perfectionism. And part of the problem with the research is finding a scientific definition of what it may be. Because on the one side, perfectionism is about setting high standards for oneself or for other people. Perfectionism can also be related to uh, being uh, unsatisfied about achievement to react negatively to mistakes. It can be being too concerned about making mistakes or not meeting standards. And it can also be described as a style related to the need to appear perfect or to perform perfectly. So, uh, because it has so many different meanings, I will try to uh, make a more precise definition of perfectionism according to the two or three main groups that do research about this topic in the States and in Britain, where uh, the most important ones are in America and in, and in Great Britain. So, which are the areas prone to perfectionism? The most important ones, of course, are work and school. And by the way, if anybody is interested, there is not that much research on perfectionism at work. And frankly, it's actually the most important area for research. There are thousands of people working as coaches, you know, all the, 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 the coaching interventions, but frankly, there is little, relatively little research on perfectionism in the workplace. And there are several reasons for being more interested in this topic because some aspects of perfectionism correlate with burnout. So performance in work is not completely unrelated to perfectionism. Okay, neatness and aesthetics, of course, eating disorders are incredibly related to perfectionism. And this is why some of the research uh, teams started, because they were interested in this aspect of eating disorders. Mm. Then we have organization and ordering. Mm. Of course, mm. people like things to be symmetric, precise, organized, and we can think of obsessive compulsive personalities, obsessive compulsive disorder, compulsions of symmetry. Mm. Writing, this is interesting, if you think of that uh, literary movement in France, Le Précieux, the Ridicule, the ridiculous, precious people writing in very uh, complicated, convoluted French language. Mm. Speaking, there's a joke about the new president of Brazil that is very perfectionist when he speaks. And the way he speaks sounds like a legal document all the time. Mm. And physical appearance, of course, again, eating disorders. And health and personally, uh, personal cleanliness, which relate on the one hand to hypochondriasis, but also to OCD and um, obsessive compulsive personality disorder. So, there are, I will present two definitions because there are slight differences between the research groups. Uh, the, the first group defines it, first of all, as a tendency. On the one hand, to establish high standards. So this is one of the elements of perfectionism. Mm -hmm. And is the, the interesting one, the non-pathological one, setting oneself high standards. For performance. This is, for example, what people in sports mm -hmm. have to have if they want to succeed. A need, an interest in achieving high standards. But it's also co absolutely common in academia. About 70% of university students in the States are perfectionists in the positive uh, sense that they want to achieve excellence. Mm. Now, the problematic aspect of perfectionism has to do with being excessively critical of one's performance. 
These are called genetically perfectionist concerns, being too worried about performance or judging performance not to be good enough. I mean, the main idea in clinical uh, perfectionism is things or performance not being good enough. And the next one is uh, uh, the concern about making mistakes. So rather than seeing mistakes as a natural part of a long process of learning, mistakes are seen as very negative things and very dangerous things. Okay, another definition, slightly different. Striving for flawlessness, trying to make your best effort not to make mistakes, not to have flaws of any kind. Your standards can be excessively high. I mean, there's nothing wrong with high standards, but your standards have to be attainable. If you cannot attain the standards, then they are problematic. And you see that in anorexia nervosa, you see that in eating disorders, people trying to have a certain body figure or a, or a certain weight, which is not even possible to attain. Okay, and then a tendency to be overly critical about one's behavior. Again, a similar definition. And then we'll see the Shafran definition, which is slightly different. Okay, so, one of the important things, you can see it as a trait, you can see it as a state, but generally perfectionism is a personality trait. Therefore, we think, can psychotherapy modify that? Well, interestingly, we, we, we conducted this research using a simple psychoeducational strategy, a workshop with only five meetings and a little book, self-help book, and actually, you know, a few of the people actually changed positively, although it was really a very, very brief intervention. So, if you look at the outcome data, you can change perfectionism, even if it's a personality style. Changing it for good, that's a different story, because permanent change is a lot more complicated. That would need something either repeated over time or a much longer intervention. Okay. Is it adaptive or maladaptive? And that's one of the big points. So, this is just for, for your orientation. Perfectionism as personality and the relationship with the big five. Of course, there is a strong relationship with conscientiousness. So, normally, if you score high in conscientiousness, you're more likely to be a perfectionist, but also more likely to be a maladaptive perfectionist. Okay. And, of course, neuroticism links with maladaptive perfectionism. And this is an interesting one. Because normally when we think about perfectionism, we think about people who are trying hard to be perfect. But perfectionism may also involve what you expect from other people. And this is the dark side of perfectionism. And, and recently I was in Argentina, I was lecturing, and you know, uh, one of the typical things every time there is a meeting is discussing why don't we don't win the World Cup because we have Messi. So, because Messi is like a wonderful player, he should win the World Cup for us. So, that is other-oriented perfectionism. He has to be perfect, so that we are happy. So, why doesn't he score five goals against Germany? So, that's the dark side of, of perfectionism. It's not just about you wanting to be perfect, but expecting other people to be perfect. So, one of the uh, persons in my team, one of my doctoral uh, students, she has done research on couples and perfectionism. This is called romantic perfectionism. Hmm. You have to be perfect if you expect me to keep on loving you. Hmm. That is very interesting. Hmm. Because the definition of a perfect partner can be quite changing. So, the, the point here is perfectionism is not just cluster C, it's not just about being obsessive compulsive, okay? It can involve many other things, especially a lot of cluster B. Okay, the common negative effects. The, the third one is quite interesting. 
People who are maladaptive perfectionists, who have clinical perfectionism, tend to have these narrow interests. Think of somebody with anorexia nervosa. 90% of the time is related to issues of food, eating, the weight, the body mass index. I have a friend who works with eating disorders all the time, and she tells me that sometimes when you have been talking about something common in Argentina, which is a sweet thing, which is called alfajor, after you have talked about for 45 minutes about that, you start thinking that maybe you should have chosen a different kind of job. Because, I mean, all the time you're talking about, you know, calories, carbohydrates, and fat, and everything, until it becomes, you know, like there's nothing else on earth. And for us, cognitive behavior therapists, uh, there are some mental processes like rumination, who seem to be quite related to perfectionism, and that is actually our present topic of research at the university. So, why is it perfectionism popular? Well, it's socially condoned. Normally, if you behave in a perfectionist way, society likes you. You're more popular than the average borderline. So, it, it gives you a structure, and it gives you a sense of control. Because now you know exactly what you're supposed to do. Mm. Every day becomes predictable. Mm. It brings achievement. But our friend Jack Beckers would say, <laughs> Eduardo, it's all about avoidance. <laughs> you know, Jack, he's an act therapist. So when you're an act therapist, 90% of your life is about avoidance. <laughs> And he is right, because, you know, perfectionism maybe is the name we give to a specific set of avoidant behaviors. Mm. Especially the link between perfectionism and procrastination seems to be mediated clearly by avoidance. So, so avoidance of feared people or situations, but also avoidance of aspects of the self that might be uh, anxiety-provoking or challenging. So... This comes from a great book written by Shafrand, Egan, and Wade. It's Overcoming Perfectionism, which I strongly recommend for your clients. And these are some of the ideas maladaptive perfectionists think will, will happen if they abandon their perfectionist behavior. As cognitive therapists, we know this. These are if-then uh, statements, typical if-then statements. And typically, you see on the right all the catastrophic consequences these people think will, will happen should they abandon their perfectionistic behaviors. So, if you look at the anecdotal stage of perfectionism, you can see things that Freud said or many of the psychanalysts of the 50s talking about perfectionism, but in general, they had two or three things in common. All of them had a negative view of perfectionism. They were all, all of them were talking about clinical perfectionism. So the question is, is there a positive aspect to perfectionism? And the second thing is they didn't do any empirical research. So it was really mostly a, a stage of, you know, clinical uh, references to things you saw in typical patients like people with obsessive compulsive personality and so on. So, when people started doing research, serious research on perfectionism, one of the things is, that came about is the, which are the dimensions of this phenomenon? And this is an important thing for us clinicians. Is there a positive perfectionism? Is there something positive about it? What about the cognitions? And then an important topic, discrepancy. And if you look at the, the work of Sigmund Freud, uh, Freud mentions something quite similar to the concept of discrepancy about a hundred years ago or more, when he says the distance between what, how you perceive yourself, your ego, and how you think you should be your ideal ego. That idea of the discrepancy be, between what you think you have achieved and that what you think you should achieve it has a long story, I mean, history in psychopathology. Okay, and then the connection between stress and burnout. So, 
uh, let me just go on the menus. So presently, everybody thinks perfectionism is multidimensional in the sense that it's not just negative, there are positive aspects about perfectionism. And this is the definition. The, sorry, there's a mistake, there is adaptive, but you can't be perfect all the time. So, adaptive perfectionism is about having, on the one hand, high standards, and that's okay. If you're an elite sportsman, you have to have high standards. If you're Djokovic, if you are Rafael Nadal, you're expected to have those high standards. Now, even when they don't meet the standards, they still see themselves as being successful. You, you, you frequently see these top tennis players saying, I didn't win today, I was playing okay, but he was playing so well that, you know, I just did my thing. Recently, Rafael Nadal said something about his match with Roger Federer, something along the lines of, of this. So they can still see themselves as successful even when they don't meet the standards. Hmm. And also, the other difference is that they see these standards as something that they want to achieve because they want to do that. They don't see them as an outside imposition. So it's very different from what you see in people with eating disorders. People with eating disorders, they, they, they want to be slim because they think society expects them to be slim. In this case, is people feel intrinsically motivated to achieve these standards. Okay? So, but the ones we normally work with in the office are the top ones. So, high standards, which are not seen as your own choice, but something that you should achieve. So, shoulds are very important. And basically, fear of making mistakes and a tendency to be harshly self-critical. If you think of compassion-focused therapy, all the work of Paul Gilbert, and self-compassion. Self-compassion has a strong link with perfectionism. So the more self-compassionate you become, the less maladaptive your perfectionism will be. So there are three most important groups. You could probably include as well Schaffron's model there. And this group suggests there are three dimensions. Self-oriented perfectionism, other-oriented perfectionism, and socially prescribed perfectionism. Definition is quite simple. I have mentioned the first two. Socially prescribed, perceived need to attain standards and expectations prescribed by significant others to win approval. So you think it's your family, your society, your group of peers. And this is quite important with teenagers. The sense that it's not just what they think or what their standards are, but what they perceive the standards of the group to be. And in Argentina, we have these huge problems with eating disorders. To give an idea, about a third of the population of teenagers and young adults have lots of risk factors for eating disorders. And so we're talking about a, you know, this a huge problem. Okay. This other group suggests um, these six dimensions, concern about mistakes, personal standards, parental expectations. You know, this is a bit ambivalent. Some of the research suggests that parental expectations play a role. Other you know, publications do not support the idea that parental expectations are so closely related to perfectionism, but it's there. Parental criticism, and this would be important if you think of avoidant personality disorder. Hmm. Doubts about actions, OCD, obsessive compulsive personality, and finally, organization. Hmm. And that is Frost, by the way, looking nice in his jacket. Hmm. Okay. Robert Slane is, this is the, the, the simplest model of all. It says there are three subscales. First of all is high standards. It doesn't matter whether you're uh, adaptive or maladaptive perfectionism, you will score high 
in that subscale. The second one is order, which is the rest less relevant, and discrepancy is interesting because this is the one that indicates psychopathology. If you have a high discrepancy, then you have some kind of psychopathology. Therefore, and this is the interesting thing, if you measure discrepancy, it becomes a very sensitive way of testing out the efficacy of your intervention. So if you do a protocol for treating perfectionism, then that is a sensitive way of measuring whether it's working or not. And they created this scale we adapted in Argentina, has a nice name, the almost perfect scale, revised. We adapt it to our population and we got very similar results to the ones you find in America. Although perfectionism can be influenced by culture, it seemed, seems to be a construct that travels well, doesn't seem to be too different in Britain, America, or in, the, or in Argentina. So, these are typical examples. I have high standards for my performance at work or school. Neatness is important to me. If you don't expect much out of yourself, you will never succeed. My best just never seems to be good enough. So this is the point I was trying to make. The difference between adaptive and maladaptive perfectionism seems to be closely related to discrepancy. Let me put it the other one from a different perspective. Striving for attaining high standards seems to be fine. And actually, when people struggle to attain high standards, they frequently have a higher quality of living. This is interesting. Being an adaptive perfectionist seems to be healthy in the sense of your quality of life seems to increase. But if you're a maladaptive perfectionist and then you worry about discrepancy, then your quality of life drops dramatically. Hmm. So it's not so much related to what you achieve, but rather than how you judge that which you achieve. That seems to be the key between normal, normalcy and psychopathology. So, you always have, well, that's a representation of the three different models and the scales with their dimensions, but this is nicer. So, when we applied this to our students, we had a significant proportion of people who are not perfectionists. They don't set themselves very high standards. And then you have the adaptive ones. Those are people who strive to achieve excellence. In other words, they will devote a lot of energy and time to achieving their goals. They will train nine hours a day to be wonderful tennis players. They will, you know, or 10 times a day to become wonderful people for the Olympic Games and so on. But the ones here, the maladaptive perfectionists, are closer to what we call perfectionist concerns. So, an important point is this. If you want to remember something, this is an important point. <laughs> okay, especially if you're interested in perfectionism at work. Because the people who struggle a lot to do a good job are actually your best employees. And interestingly, their burnout is low. So they can work intensely for a long time and be happy about it. So an important thing, if you're going to work with perfectionism in the office, never suggest that lowering the standards is the trick. That's out of the question, okay? So don't go for that because it's a bad idea. If you remember Feeling Good by David Burns, Hmm. He suggests doing that. Forget about it. It doesn't work. Hmm. Okay? So if you say you need to lower your standards, they come, don't come back anymore. Hmm. So don't say that. Hmm. Because first of all, there's nothing wrong with having high standards. Okay? It actually helps people have, you know, 
And think of ourselves. It's a good thing that research says that, because I remember the last time I was here was like 40 Celsius inside the room. <laughs> and we were going from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. <laughs> so, you know, dedicating yourself to achieving high standards is not the problem. <laughs> Perfectionist concerns are the problem. Now, an important thing for researchers. The problem is that a lot of times people are trying to do research on perfectionism and they forget to split these two dim dimensions and then the results of the research are completely obscured. This is a very important point that Stuber makes and you have to have in mind, a lot of the research we have uh, about perfectionism in the workplace is not useful because the, the people doing the research have not made the difference between perfectionistic strivings and perfectionistic concerns. So, this is an interesting point. If you look at burnout, for example, involvement, how much you enjoy your work, if you look at that, if you have perfectionist strivings, burnout is low. But if you have perfectionistic concerns, burnout goes through the roof. So, this is the problem when people just mention perfectionism without suggesting whether it's maladaptive or adaptive, then you get very strange conclusions. Okay. Perfectionist styles of thinking, you've known all of these, you've seen lots of this during the training. Mm. Catastrophization for Sylvia, who is a fan of schema therapy, unrelenting standards. <laughs> This, I mean, in many psychopathological uh, models and psychotherapies, people have stressed how unrelenting standards can be problematic. Mm. But of course, it's the psychopathological way of dealing with the issues of achievement, okay? So, an important point of this lecture is perfectionism is not necessarily a bad thing. Mm. And this is why we normally say adaptive perfectionism and maladaptive perfectionism, or Rosalind Shafran from Reading says, well, we call it clinical perfectionism. Because she says, I am a clinician and we don't care about the adaptive one. Because we don't treat the adaptive people anyway. And this is an interesting one, shoot statements, they're very important. And this one, unfair comparisons. Again, some of these you have seen through your training, mm. not knowing when to let go, mm. and hoarding and avoidance, two typical perfectionist behaviors. How does it develop? Well, this is, you know, a number of factors, childhood factors, temperament, attachment, parental factors, mm. environmental pressures. Culture has a lot to do with it. For example, in Argentina, we have these huge problems with eating disorders. Every time I come here, I always mention to you that they start opening these sandwiches and everything. In Argentina, women would be, you know, completely ashamed or afraid of being judged by other people for eating a sandwich in front of them. So, the pressure to be perfect, and this would lead to either no perfectionism, or perfectionism related to other people or to yourself. Now, this is an interesting model Rosalind Shafran has developed for how is perfectionist, clinical perfectionism maintained. So she says, the, first, the, the most important thing in clinical perfectionism is you define your self-worth according to performance. So, you are, your self-concept depends on what you achieve. So, therefore you have inflexible standards. And these standards combine with cognitive biases and performance-related behavior, and they may generate three different situations. This one is very nice. The problem with clinical perfectionism is that even when they attain the standards, they think that reaching the standards means that the standards were too low. Mm. 
<laughs> so they raise the bar. And this is a typical behavior, okay? So if I have achieved that goal, it means the goal was not difficult enough. Therefore, again, I have been too lazy. I have set myself to low standards. I should be better next time. If they fail to attend the standard, then they will typically indulge in self-criticism and in counterproductive behaviors, or they may even choose to avoid attempting to attain standards. And this seems to be the typical pathway that connects perfectionism with procrastination. So, the higher the standard, the more likely people will procrastinate. I have a very nice client. He's 23. He's studying computer engineering. And when I started asking him, you know, because he's sort of delayed in his studies, very intelligent man. So I asked him, okay, I need, <laughs> how about making a little, you know, diary, how you use your time and what your goals for this term are. So the guy wanted to do computer engineering, which is already a very challenging, you know, kind of studies. He's also a member of the bureau that runs the department because he represents the, the students in the, the body of government. He's also engaged in a group of people who do critics of, you know, critics of cinema, so they have to watch the movies and get together for criticism. He also started a band, a rock band. He also has to meet, you know, his girlfriend and everything. So these are the typical things, you know, they, they have such high standards that they don't have the, simply don't have the time to attain all of those. Therefore, rather than delegating or giving up on standards, they just postpone things. So procrastination can be related to perfectionism. It's not always related to perfectionism, but it's a, one of the varieties of procrastination that you see. And this, of course, in the workplace is very important because it means not achieving things and having lots of employees who don't understand that good enough is better than perfect but late. So, These are examples that Rosalind Shafran mentions. So what is the, one of the important points? Maladaptive perfectionism is, on the one hand, the cause, or one of the factors, causal factors for certain, for many disorders, but it's also a maintaining factor for many disorders. So these are just some studies. There are lots of them. There's a clear link between depression and maladaptive perfectionism. GAD, people with generalized anxiety disorder are, you know, typical representatives of clinical perfectionism because not doing things perfectly is too dangerous. Who knows what might happen if you don't bring up your children perfectly. People with social anxiety disorder, if you don't behave perfectly, then who knows what may happen, you will be criticized. Same thing with OCD, eating disorders, suicidal ideation, stress and burnout. So, these are examples. For example, in social anxiety disorder, you typically see the fear of making social mistakes. And that's about action, how to act in social performance and thinking too much about it in order to avoid negative consequences. And perfectionism can be related to certain types of obsessions and compulsions. For example, I remember a client with OCD who had to have, this was many years ago, her collection of CDs had to be in alphabetical order. <laughs> so every time she wanted to listen to something, it was a sort of a chaos, chaotic thing because there was a danger of ruining the alphabetical order. <laughs> And you know, the, the obsessive compulsive cognitions work group has included uh, perfectionism as one of the traits, basic traits of OCD. So, what is the main message? Treating maladaptive perfectionism may contribute 
to the treatment of the disorder in which it plays a maintaining role or a causal role. Classical example, you may remember Christopher Fervent's treatment for eating disorders. And in the long version, in the 40-week version, you have a module for clinical perfectionism that was designed by Rosalind Shafran, the person I mentioned before. But also, if you think of what would the value of treating perfectionism be, because it's a risk factor as well, it can also be a way of preventing relapse. So, there are many reasons why we would like to treat perfectionism. For example, with depression, it can be a way of protecting people from relapse in depression. So, important point, perfectionism is a transdiagnostic process. It is not a diagnosis in itself, but it's a phenomenon that you see in many disorders. So, there are four points. The first one is the one I already mentioned. Perfectionism is also interesting for explaining comorbidity, how two disorders are related. It can be explanatory factor for the maintenance of a variety of psychopathologies. And the good news is that treating perfectionism reduces a number of psychopathologies. So rather than triggering, uh, targeting sorry, the DSM disorders, we can target perfectionism as a transdiagnostic process and then expect results that may affect different psychopathologies. So these are examples of, you know, transdiagnostic roles of of perfectionism. Mm. See, I must be socially perfect, I must check perfectly, I must attain very high goals at work to be good enough. Mm. So, for example, as a consequence, you will see self-focused attention on social performance. Mm. So, self-focused attention, by the way, is a transdiagnostic construct. Mm. So, rather than thinking of social anxiety disorder or obsessive compulsive disorder, we can think of self-focused attention and perfectionism as two transdiagnostic phenomena which are related. Mm. In the case of OCD, you have responsibility for checking doors perfectly to prevent harm. So again, typically, perfectionism in anxiety disorders seems to be the kind of behavior you need to have in order to avoid catastrophic consequences. So this is the point that Martin Anthony makes. And the good point is that every, every time I, we mention Martin Anthony, we have this tendency of calling him Mark Anthony, especially the, when we went to Puerto Rico, we were listening to Mark Anthony all the time. So, and this would be the relationship with depression. Self-evaluative negative thoughts as failing in work and in life. So, treating maladaptive perfectionism, standard and not so standard strategies. In order to summarize, this is a list of the things you can do. First of all, Shafran gives a, a number of questions, interesting questions for deriving her model. I just gave you the example of uh, her conceptualization form. You can analyze the pros and cons of perfectionism because clients will typically think there are lots of pros. So you have to sell treatment as a way of keeping the pros and getting rid of the cons. Explaining that high standards are not the problem is already something that will you know, make the patient listen to you because typically people tell them they should lower their standards and that's not the way out. Okay, short-term and long-term costs of perfectionism. Typically, clients will have difficulties understanding the long-term consequences because, as behaviorism tells us, behavior is governed by short-term consequences. If you look at behaviorism, if you look at politics, you understand that. It's always short-term consequences. So, expand self-evaluation to other areas of life. When I was writing this one, I was remembering an episode of Big Bang Theory. 
in which Sheldon, the incredibly bright doctor in physics, challenged this very attractive woman who works in the Cheesecake Factory to some sort of trivial pursuit, a game about who knows the most, and she starts saying, okay, how about rock bands? Hmm. Of course, it doesn't have a clue about rock and roll bands. So this is an interesting point. You're narrowing your self-evaluation to something very specific. Hmm. Surveys, hmm, behavioral experiment, all or non beliefs tested out by behavioral experiments. This is an interesting one, identifying shoots. Hmm. Behaving not perfectly, reducing the time for completing a task, behavioral experiments, thought records, flashcards, smartphone notes, just do it reminders. These are the standard ones. What are the not so standard ones? Okay. If you think of all the I have a friend who works in England and he says, if I hear the word compassion again, I think I will vomit. Hmm? Because self-compassion and compassion have become so popular as clinical interventions that they're all over the place. So the point is that perfectionism is a wonderful area for practicing compassion and self-compassion. Hmm. It's actually a very good area to start practicing, you know, giving up self-criticism. Because you can actually prove to the client that you can change without affecting performance. That you can become less self-critical without affecting performance. So it's a rather interesting way of presenting the, con the, the concept of self-compassion. Because of course other varieties of self-compassion will be a lot more difficult. Okay, so just as a summary, these are the questions that Shafran includes for deriving the model. You will find them in Overcoming Perfectionism, her, her book for clients, uh, published in 2009 in Britain. And you use this, all these questions to fill in all of the gaps in this conceptualization model. So you see the, the questions, for example, think about how anxiety, low mood, and stress contribute to the cycle of perfectionism. Add these to the diagram. Mm. If you do perceive that you sometimes meet your standards, put this in the diagram with a recent example. Notice what happens when you reach your standards. And that would be here. Mm. One of the basic points is helping clients notice that they're never happy, no matter what happens. The cycle of self-criticism goes on and on. So, advantages of perfectionism, changing, not changing. This is very important because clients can see the results and they're very scared that they will give up perfectionism and they will you know, end up having nothing. Typically in academia, you see that students think that if they stop studying uh, in a perfectionist way, their grades, their marks will suffer. And actually the research proves it's not the case. This is interesting because we can present objective data showing that that is not the case. So, try to think in one year's time if you don't change what is going to be the case. And interestingly, we ask them to cover all the most important areas in life so that they don't, you know, remain focused on just one small area of achievement. If you don't change, what do you think things will be like in one year's time? This is a typical way we sell things in CBT. <laughs> okay. If you change, maybe in a year's time, things will be different. Your hair will be wonderful. You'll be very happy, like in a Hollywood movie. Okay, so expanding self-evaluation. Who do you want to be in this area? This is also not so standard because it has to do with analyzing values. What do you want your life to stand for? People who are very... 
perfectionists, the clinical perfectionists, they, they are too focused on achievement. And as you know, goals you can achieve, values you can never achieve. <laughs> so, but this is a good idea that comes from modern behavior therapy. If you ask clients to think about values, which are the general directions in life, because you cannot achieve them, you can achieve goals, but you cannot achieve your values, that helps with understanding the difference between doing something right away because you need to do it perfectly and taking the long-term perspective. The good thing about values is they force people to take the long-term perspective. So, these are typical examples. We see this a lot in, in clients with OCD. I must be 100% sure that the gas is perfectly closed. I used to have a client with OCD that was checking the stove so frequently that he actually damaged the thing. And you, this typical OCD, it ended being dangerous because then it, you could have a leak because you were ruining the valve. Okay. Appearance, hygiene, artistic performance, musical performance. This is an interesting one. Um, I have a friend who used to have this recording studio and the, the sound engineers would have this trick. When someone had to sing, you know, typically you record the, the music first and then singers sing on top of the recordings. So typically when you turn on the red light, they get very anxious and performance suffers, it's not very nice. So sound engineers would typically say to them, okay, just do it, you know, just for the sake of seeing, you know, noticing the way it sounds and to take levels and everything, but just do it, you know, for the sake of noticing volume. And then they recorded that. And often those recordings were much nicer than the ones you got when you told people, okay, right now we need to record this perfectly. So, Musical performance, sporting performance, academic performance, all typical areas of perfectionism. Okay. Intimate relationships, that's a very complex topic, but it's a wonderful thing, <laughs> analyzing expectations of people of their partner's behavior. The, study, the, the results that we got in the study are in some ways mixed. Prediction was that clinical perfectionists would have much, much more uh, maladjustment or disadjustment in, uh, in their partners. It was not quite that uh, much, but still you see that clinical perfectionism, especially perfectionism oriented to the other person, uh, damages the intimate relationship, the, the quality of the relationship. So, Avoidance and procrastination, as I have mentioned, probably because there are two or three basic mechanisms underlying perfectionism. We think one is rumination and the other one, the typical one, is avoidance. So if you want to think of this, Jacques Bakers and, and an act therapist will say, okay, perfectionism is just the name. But yes, it is a name, but it's a useful name. I mean, it's true we can really decompose perfectionism into three or four mechanisms, but still the name can be clinically useful, especially for explaining things to clients. Okay, checking performance. Okay, and these are some examples for service. I make more mistakes than other people. The mistakes I make are worse than other people's mistakes. And something to, uh, to close the presentation. Mm. This is an interesting one. The way you conduct the behavioral experiments, mm. you identify the belief, mm. you identify the prediction in general. This is standard CBT, but nevertheless, it's interesting. Mm. You need to specify the prediction precisely. Mm. Remember the rule. <laughs> if you don't do this, then clients will typically, you know, you know, take the results and modify the prediction accordingly. And reflect on the results and revise the belief. The main idea with the behavioral experiments is that at least what you get is a much better experience at doing the same thing. 
And sometimes you even get better results. I just gave you an example. Musically, if you sing a song trying to enjoy it, normally you do it better than if you try to sing the song perfectly. It's like going to a restaurant and trying to eat what you have to eat perfectly. You remember that mindfulness, one of the rules in mindfulness is that you need to experience the present moment without judging. So one of the problems with perfectionism is it involves judging all the time because you need to compare results. So one of the classical reflections clients will do is that not judging all the time actually increases the experience at least in terms of the way you go through the experience, even if you don't change the results. So, these are classical examples. There's nothing strange about it. It's reducing the amount of time spent on a task. And you can find them in the book by Rosalind Shafran. So, two or three things I would like to say before the end. So, main point is, almost everybody agrees these days that we have to make a difference between clinical perfectionism and adaptive perfectionism. Adaptive perfectionism is a positive thing. It makes people achieve uh, and it also makes people happy about achievement and we need that. The second thing is we need a lot more research especially in the workplace, about perfectionism. The second thing is that a lot of the research that has been done is not very good, not very useful, because of the confound between perfectionism strivings and perfectionistic concerns. It's the concerns which are typically related to psychopathology. The next thing is perfectionism is, is transdiagnostic and you can think of it as a name. Behavior therapists will, behavioral therapists will probably say that this is just a name for some basic mechanisms. Okay, but it's a useful name. And the next thing is the word perfectionism in general has a negative undertone, so you need to explain to clients the difference between adaptive and maladaptive perfectionism. And please have this one in mind. You have to say right to the very beginning that the standards are not the problem. Standards are only a problem when they are not attainable. So, if your client wants to attain something impossible, then what you have to say, the problem is not that the standard is high, it's that the standard is not rational. So, if by definition this is not possible, then you should say so. But in most cases, Standards are not the problem, and you have to say that right away. The next thing, don't think that perfectionism is just obsessive-compulsive personality disorder, because it's not the case. Borderlines can be very perfectionistic, because borderlines typically self-invalidate. So one of the typical forms of self-invalidation is setting yourself very high standards. You know, one of the classical things they do is, I'm going to start this business. I have no experience, I have no capital, but of course I can do it because it's very easy. Hmm. I always quote John Lennon when I talk about borderlines. Hmm. You may remember the song Imagine. Hmm. Imagine there's no countries, it's easy if you try. Hmm. Yes, if you don't live in Poland, if you live in England, there is an island maybe. <laughs> but this is a, that's a classical borderline idea that is just a matter of trying. That is very common in clinical perfectionism. So that's the other point. You will see perfectionism in many people who don't have obsessive compulsive personalities. So, thanks a lot for your patience. Remember, English is not my first language, so it's a problem for me as well. <laughs> And uh, congratulations to the ones who are receiving their diplomas today. May you have long, fruitful careers, wonderful patients, mostly with social anxiety disorder. <laughs> Thanks.